It is this blocking of the soul that gives us religious intolerance. It breaks homes. It leaves parents and children isolated. It does all the things we do not want to have happen. And wherever we break the soul's laws, we suffer and we are sad. We weep. We, we realize that something is desperately wrong. Uh, there is no pleasure left in life for us because all our affairs go badly. But we people do not realize, apparently, that this is all due to the fact that we have declared war upon the best of ourselves. We are determined to destroy that which prevents us from doing what we please. And as that which we want to destroy is the only indestructible part of ourselves, that we come in the end to a stalemate. The uh, Neoplatonists of Alexandria uh, discovered in the works of Plato uh, the idea of a great religious system. We are told by Proclus of, uh, of Athens, who was the last of the Platonic successors, that Plato's philosophy was the outer cover for a religion. And therefore, Proclus in his books on the theology of Plato lets us know that in the closing years of his life, Plato transformed his whole philosophy into a way of life, a very simple way, that the end of philosophy is that the individual shall experience the divinity of life. That philosophy is not an end but a means, and that the end of all philosophy is that man shall love the beautiful, serve the good, and honor the integrities of existence. That philosophy gives us our first basic understanding of the true nature of God. And that by the philosophy we can justify the correction of our own imperfections. We can find a natural theology, a theology that is supported by natural law, that is obvious in the world wherever we look around us. It is the actual integrity by which every function of existence is maintained. The Alexandrian Neoplatonists took this concept and began to interpret again philosophy in terms of a great internal discipline, an experience of, of universal integrities. Philosophy was not destroyed by this. Uh, mysticism does not destroy as a philosophy. It consummates it as far as philosophy itself is honorable. Philosophy shows us many of the truths which help us to have the courage to go out and live well. But to end in an argument concerning abstractions is to destroy the essential value of philosophy. Philosophy is not a mere intellectualism. It is not something in which the individual trying desperately to be wise uh, fails in all of his values of life. Philosophy is simply the outer chamber of a great universal system. It is one of the outside steps leading into a temple. Uh, philosophy is therefore perhaps summed up in man's discovery that all things are reasonable, all things are just, and all things move inevitably to the fulfillment of their ordainment by divinity. So this concept of a philosophical theology in which the individual grew rather than received absolution vicariously. This philosophy that became Neoplatonism and later so influenced Emerson and the school in Concord Mass was simply a realization that there was a natural way of doing things that is not spectacular, that is not full of fads, that does not require the individual to viciously attack things that do not seem to work out to his particular satisfaction, but a philosophy that is natural, kindly, good-natured, and peaceful. It is said on one occasion that Emerson, in an effort to uh, prove his democracy, so to say, after all he was the great uh, American Brahmin, very much tradition-bound, but he uh, thought that as a great evidence uh, that he should have the maid and the servant in the house eat with the family at meals as a sign of the recognition of democracy. 
After about three or four times of this experience, the maid and the housekeeper asked to be relieved of this responsibility, as they had much more pleasure eating quietly by themselves and not becoming involved too much in family affairs. But apparently, Emerson got the message. He realized, therefore, that his effort was wrong. He had tried to make a symbolic example of something, but he had not sensed the realities of life. He learned more from the fact that they didn't want to eat at the table than in anything else that he could have gained in the form of satisfaction for his statement of democracy. Things have to be what they are, but everything is what it is and can be beautiful. There is no reason why any truth should hurt anybody. The only person it can hurt is the person who doesn't believe in truth. But, on the other hand, to go around making cruel remarks against other people, this isn't a matter of truth. This is always ulteriorly motivated. There is spite, there is vengeance, there is uh, some type of ulterior motive whenever we are unkind. We're trying to get some kind of satisfaction. We are trying to fulfill something in ourselves at the expense of other people. Neoplatonism and mysticism do not work on this particular level or in this type of thinking. Now, we have hundreds and hundreds of groups coming, springing up now on all kinds of religious principles. Some of them are very good. Some of them are maybe good. And some of them are obviously not good. But they are all based upon some concept of something. All of them, finally, to fulfill a constructive purpose, <clears throat> must come back to the same rules. No system uh, can grow or help other people to grow unless it helps the individual to correct his own mistakes. Unless he is impelled to be a better person, no organization can make him one. No organization can save him by taking him out of the thundering herd and isolating him on the top of a mountain. No uh, divine plan can be fulfilled through the use of narcotics. All these various shortcuts, all these various original ideas, some of them are the results of metaphysical speculation, some of them probably of psychic uh, activity. But any system that does not make the basic requirement, the requirement of self-improvement, and self-improvement in this case not becoming wiser in worldly things, but becoming better in the virtues of life. No system that does not teach the individual to escape from the pressure of his own attitudes can do anything of very prominent value. We have to break through the shell we have built, the shell of our own infallibility, the shell of our own uniqueness, the shell that we have been picked out by destiny for some noble purpose. All these attitudes must be gradually overcome. And it's only when we overcome these things and become what we ought to be, natural human beings, that, the, that nature or the infinite can use us for some major purpose or project. Those who have done the most for the world have been those who have forgotten themselves and their own spirituality and tried to work every day for the benefit of the people. We also must expect no rewards. The reward is not in anything except growth. The final reward for the good deed is growth. We become better people. And because we are better people, we can do more for others. The whole problem of growth, therefore, is one of it being self-rewarding or self-fulfilling. We grow and in so doing become a little wiser, a little better, a little more beautiful within ourselves. Actually, according to the Greeks and the Egyptians, the human soul is the link between spirit and body. It represents the middle distance between the exterior world and the internal. Through the soul, the eternal moves into the temporal. Through the soul, the divine root of life becomes a tree and spreads downward to become the mortal world in which we live. 
all things are in their middle distances soul. That is why everything in its natural state is beautiful. The stars are beautiful, the sky is beautiful, the earth is beautiful. They are all symbols of a beauty which is normalcy, order, integrity, and justice. The soul, therefore, links man's spiritual and material life. In alchemy, it is the transforming and transmuting agency. It is that power by means of which it is possible for the human being to transcend himself. It is his link with the infinite. It is that part of his own nature which alone can survive, which alone can fulfill, and alone can solve all the problems of existence, and solve them by the simple realization that there are no problems except the ones he creates himself. So man living in a beautiful universe has a right to enjoy it. He has a right to share in it and be part of it and live with it, he has a right to have the natural joys of life, but he also has the problem to realize that any pleasure that is detrimental to his own nature or damaging to any other person cannot be a true uh, jo source of comfort or consolation. The individual cannot be selfish and grow. He cannot nurse his own temperament and outgrow it. On the other hand, people have tried for years to fight against themselves. And very often this is a terrible fight. It is a, a fight against shadows. It is a, a tremendous resistance against demons of formless or mindless structure. To fight against this selfishness does not seem to do any good. The individual simply becomes more and more neurotic. He always wanted to do something. He disciplines himself by not doing it, and he gets sick. Therefore, he cannot intellectually and willfully dominate his own personality any more than he can dominate his world. The only answer lies not in this fight against that which is not right, but the quiet acceptance of that which is right. Instead of opposing evil, we strengthen good. And then when we strengthen good, we discover that evil is only a shadow. It is only a not-being, which we have mistaken for a reality because it had within it certain values which we liked, but which had no permanent place in the universal policy of things. If we begin to grow, the evil slips away. We no longer wish that which is not good once we have really discovered the importance of being right in things. Now the uh, problem of the release of the soul is in a sense an experience which Protinus in Alexandria and Proclus both mentioned. It is a moment, maybe, only a moment, as we find it mentioned in Havelock Ellis' Dance of Life. It is an instant in which the tremendous nature of the internal is made known to us. And every effort to describe it has been futile. No one can describe in words that which is a divine fact. In those moments, the individual, in a few, in a few seconds, can have an experience that changes his whole life. It is a, an experience, the first contact we have with the infinite. It is a, suddenly, a sudden awareness of the, divi the divinity within ourselves. And that divinity comes in great quietude, great gentleness, and, and eternal peace. It is not approaching in glory or in power or authority or majesty. It is suddenly the experience of the infinite love that governs all things the divine power of eternal right and the realization that all the sufferings and problems we go through are necessary because through them and through them alone can we discover this ultimate right. This power that is much more potent than anything we know. From the moment of that experience, as Protinus tells us, there can be no doubt about anything that is good. There can be no deviation from the path of righteousness. There can be no temptation 
because